Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. If we don't drastically cut our carbon emissions by mid-century, we are screwed. Two recent reports, one from the UN, another from the US government, warn that extreme weather, wildfire, drought, flooding, and famine are all going to get worse unless we move away from the fossil fuels that emit CO2 and degrade our environment. Both our safety and the health of the global economy are at stake. Yet, the world's largest and most reliable source of carbon-free power is falling out of favor. I'm talking about nuclear energy. A slew of countries, including the US, Germany, and Japan, are closing nuclear power facilities. Worse, they're often replaced by carbon-intensive coal and gas plants. This counter-climate trend has a lot to do with economics, but it's also connected to concerns about the safety of nuclear energy production. But is that fear overblown? A misplaced apprehension fueled by both Hollywood and nuclear war hysteria. And furthermore, can government support and new innovation help turn nuclear power into the viable climate change solution we've all been waiting for? Renewable energy sources like wind and solar are not going to save us, not in the short term at least. We need a massive overhaul of the energy sector right away. Jeremy Richardson, a senior energy analyst at the Union of Concerned Scientists, told me while renewables are the ideal, they simply cannot be scaled fast enough to replace fossil fuels. At the moment, they're unable to generate enough energy to power our lives. Plus, they require massive amounts of land. Consider, a new paper by Harvard researchers found that sourcing all American energy consumption from wind power, for instance, would require 72% of the continental US's land area. That doesn't leave us a ton of space to live. That would also displace a lot of animals. Plus, existing solar panel and wind turbine fields have already raised concerns about wildlife safety and biodiversity. Furthermore, international relations professor Joshua Goldstein, co-author of the forthcoming book, A Bright Future, How Some Countries Have Solved Climate Change and the Rest Could Follow, told me renewable energy suffers from production variability. That is, the amount of energy generated changes between night and day, between summer and winter. Granted, renewable technology is rapidly improving. Hopefully advances in storage, i.e. in batteries, will mitigate some of those variability issues. Plus, they're becoming more cost efficient. Wind power is more than two thirds less expensive than it was in 2009. The cost of solar has fallen over 75% since then. So perhaps, eventually, the sun, the wind, and water can power all of our lives in full. But we're not on an eventually timeline anymore. The consequences of climate neglect are bearing down on us rapidly. We need to replace our fossil fuels right now. And the only proven carbon-free energy source capable of filling that large void is nuclear energy. Nuclear, after all, is already a carbon-free workhorse, providing 20% of the United States' electricity. Renewables, on the other hand, provide just 17%. And while renewables have scalability issues that I just talked about, nuclear can grow much quicker. In fact, Goldstein told me that nuclear can scale five times faster than renewables. In other words, what renewables can do in a century, nuclear can do in just 20 years. But we're going in the opposite direction. Several Western countries are phasing out their nuclear facilities. The US had 108 reactors in 1990. By 2017, there were 99. Now, in the case of Germany, the closures were explicitly linked to the 2011 Fukushima accident. Much more on that in a minute. But in general, economic viability is the culprit behind nuclear's decline. Specifically, alternative energy sources are getting cheaper, making nuclear energy less desirable from a bottom line perspective. I already talked about the cost improvements in wind and solar, but most importantly, the price of carbon emitting natural gas has plunged as fracking and vertical drilling have emerged as extraction technologies. Plus, we still have a huge global supply of coal and countries like China and India are using it to fuel their economic expansions. Of course, US President Donald Trump has also embraced the carbon intensive coal industry. We are putting our great coal miners back to work. All of this is bad news for nuclear power, which is struggling to stay competitive. According to one study, a third of existing plants in the US are unprofitable or scheduled to close. 
Now, when plants are finally up and running, they're actually able to produce energy at a pretty cost-efficient rate. But Ahmed Abdullah, a fellow at the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, told me it's the initial investment that's so expensive. It's the complexity of the projects and navigating the myriad and often evolving safety requirements that puts investors in a financial hole that might take decades to climb out of. And when your pathway to profit is so long-term, who knows if there's some disruptive technology that could come out of nowhere and knock you right out of existence. For some folks, this is proof that energy production in the era of climate change consequences shouldn't be exclusively governed by the profit motive and bottom line rationale. In a recent paper, the Union of Concerned Scientists recommend adopting a carbon price. Watch our video for more background, but essentially, a carbon price would make energy from coal and natural gas more expensive, which would make nuclear and renewables more competitive, which would spur investments in clean energy, which would save the planet. However, as I point out in that piece we did, carbon pricing is politically untenable because nobody likes an increase in their utility bill or the price of filling up their car. Recent unrest in France, where a widespread protest movement arose after a plan was announced to raise fuel taxes, attests to that fact. Moreover, any policy or financial support of the nuclear power industry is particularly tricky because there's a long-standing public perception that nuclear energy is unsafe. Michael Schellenberger, president of Environmental Progress, told me this traces back to the atomic bomb. After the death and destruction in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after a generation of Cold War schoolchildren were taught to duck and cover in cases of a nuclear attack, we became afraid of anything associated with nuclear. Schellenberger told me this is a classic case of psychological displacement. We feared the weapon, but we were powerless to stop it. So instead, we directed our anxiety and anger towards nuclear energy. After all, nuclear plants were being opened up in communities across the country, and across the world, people could actually go to them and protest. Pop culture seized on this fear and anxiety. Nuclear meltdowns, nuclear holocaust, and terrorists pursuing nuclear materials is a recurring theme. A current Netflix series, Dark, centers around a shady nuclear power plant. The book I happen to be reading at the moment, Cloud Atlas, involves a poorly designed nuclear reactor. There's greedy Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, the evil owner of a nuclear facility. Of course, Godzilla is the menacing product of radiation exposure. The list goes on. Schellenberger also noted that the news media seized on any little routine accident at a power plant and blew it up disproportionately, an assertion that brings to mind Elon Musk's recent complaints about coverage of Tesla's issues. To be fair, there have been three high-profile nuclear accidents, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. However, Goldstein and Schellenberger noted that Three Mile Island, which prompted the Time Magazine headline, Nuclear Nightmare, is actually proof that the safety systems around nuclear function. Schellenberger told me multiple errors were made. The reactor literally melted down, yet no person or even an animal died, and an insignificant amount of radiation went into the surrounding area. The containment zone worked. Meanwhile, the Fukushima accident was the product of the fourth biggest earthquake since 1900. It was hit by a 50-foot wave from a tsunami. But again, the actual radiation released was not that significant, and the fatalities had more to do with a botched evacuation than a facilities failure. Chernobyl did leave a body count and has created long-term problems, many associated with the inadequate government response to the crisis. However, Goldstein pointed out that taken together in the context of nuclear power's decades-long history, this is a pretty good track record, especially compared to the energy alternatives. Air pollution, caused in large part by coal, kills seven million people a year. Brown coal is particularly problematic. Per unit of energy, it kills 442 times more people than does nuclear. And that's not even factoring in the deterioration to the climate, which could result in millions of deaths in the future. That's why Goldstein called fear of nuclear power irrational. Abdullah said there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance going on, a growing gap between the actual risk and the perceived risk. Goldstein added that a particularly overblown fear surrounds the cleanup and management of nuclear waste. If an average American got all their electricity for their entire lives from nuclear power, the resulting waste could fit in a soda can. He said, we figured out how to store this waste in large, safe casks, and we could simply bury them deep underground. Although, of course, there is the problem of who is willing to open up their community to radioactive materials. I do think that keeping 
carbon-free sources of power in the mix is important. Would you be comfortable with America's nuclear waste repository in Rhode Island? Of course not. Look, I'm not saying there are no legitimate concerns about nuclear power or figuring out what to do with waste. Richardson, a physicist by training, told me we figured out how to make nuclear power technology work. We just have to be very careful and take safety precautions very seriously. Neither side of this debate ought to be dismissive of each other. Nations can also learn lessons from one another. France and South Korea are leaders in nuclear energy. South Korea has standardized reactor designs and has developed a bit of a nuclear assembly line, which allows for efficiencies and economies of scale. That's been harder to do in the US, where rival companies pursue unique designs and different regulators in different states have different requirements. But Perhaps a new generation of reactors can put the U.S. back on the nuclear path, ones that are smaller, therefore less expensive, ones that can be built in factories, which could avoid on-site construction challenges. Because the thing is, yes, nuclear energy comes with trade-offs. We'll never completely eradicate the safety concerns. It's not as sustainable as wind and solar. It's more expensive than natural gas and coal. But we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Because unlike renewables, nuclear can scale quickly. Unlike CO2 emitting fossil fuels, it doesn't worsen climate change. So policymakers and the voters that hold them accountable ought to support this industry before it's too late. Maybe that's subsidies, maybe that's a carbon tax, maybe that's a price guarantee. Whatever the case, let's quit hoping for a miracle and pursue the solution right in front of us. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life. 